just want to continue to live with the body of Christ because obviously, you know, it, you know, that God wants to hear all of our needs. He wants to hear all, you know, he, he, he said, the Bible says, cast all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. And that's what he wants us to do. Amen. If you read your Bibles, we are in 2 Timothy tonight. We finished uh, 1 Timothy last week, and so we're on to 2 Timothy. And so uh, I want to do a little bit of background here, you know, in the beginning after we read, you know, through uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, but we're going to do a little bit of background, kind of get an idea of where they are now. This is, you know, several years later uh, when Paul wrote, uh, you know, from when Paul wrote his first letter to Timothy about uh, his church, you know, that he has in Ephesus. And so uh, this is, you know, going to, you know, kind of, you know, figure it out. And tonight, the title of my sermon is How to Maintain a Fire. Oftentimes people will go and, you know, they get all like excited about some conference they went to or they, some church service gave them goosebumps or whatever, I mean, all that kind of stuff. But they always say, you know what, when I come back home, you know, it's not like it how it was there and they don't know how to maintain that fire that, you know, that they got at that event. Well, I'll tell you here, you know, I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert. It doesn't matter where you're at. God is the same here as he is there. Okay. But I'm going you know, to show you from what it says, uh, from what Paul is telling Timothy to do in order to keep that and maintain that. So uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved, dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus, in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from uh, my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly uh, desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which uh, dwelt first in, uh, thy, uh, in thy grandmother Lo uh, Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee, by the putting on of, of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not uh, thou therefore uh, ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a, with a holy calling, not according to our own works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Verse 10, but, now, but is now made manifest, by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath uh, brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the, for the, which, uh, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that, that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the, uh, the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by uh, the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest that all they, uh, all they uh, which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom... Uh, Phage uh, Phagellus and Homogenes, the Lord, uh, the, more, the Lord gave give mercy unto the house of uh, Anisiphorus, uh, for his for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when uh, he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may uh, find mercy of the of the Lord in that day. And in, and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for thy word. Lord, I ask that your word would find fertile soil upon our hearts. 
Lord, that we, would, uh, that we would listen to your word, but we also be doers of your word. And Lord, that when we hear your word, Lord, that we would be obedient, that we let our words be few, but our actions speak louder th- than those words. And Lord, I pray that tonight that you would show us how to maintain that fire that was first given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Quick note, this Saturday, I forgot that you announced this, this Saturday is our, uh, we're going to the pumpkin barn at, um, at Shirley Farms in O'Bion. Uh, if you got a bulletin on Sunday, the address is on there. We'll, we will meet there at 10 o'clock in the morning. The cost is $11 per person. And uh, just wanted to make that, uh, you aware of that. We had a great time this morning at the nursing home um, out that way as well. And so that was a good time being able to see uh, those that are out there and being able to minister to them and let them know. I spoke to them this morning about the assurance of their salvation, about the assurance of their salvation and those benefits that come along with it. You know, you just don't get eternal life, but there's a whole lot more that comes with it. And you say, well, that's just enough. Well, you know what? God blesses us abundantly above, all, you know, whatever we can ask or think or imagine, right? And so just, you know, say, hey, I'm just glad not to be going to hell. Well, you know what? There's a whole lot more that God is going to give you. So it's like, it's going to be like, you know, Christmas, like every single day, you know, and then some. All right. So let's do a little bit of background here on 2 Timothy and uh, on this. So this, you know, this second, you know, letter, this epistle from Paul to Timothy was written shortly before Paul's death. He writes this, you know, it's like almost like a final letter that he writes. There's a couple other letters, I believe, you know, that he writes. One of them would be the book of Romans before Paul dies. But he, this is one of the ones that he writes before his death. He wants to encourage Timothy to remain faithful to the gospel. Why? Because, you know what, he's in jail, he's being persecuted. And it's possible that Timothy is feeling like, you know what, you know, is this really all worth it? And Paul's saying, it is worth it, keep doing it. This is the reason why I do it, because of this. It's not the fact that Paul has like a death wish or he's suicidal, but the fact is, is that Paul knows, you know what, when I preach Jesus, this is going to happen. Jesus told, uh, you know, told us, he didn't, like we talked about a few weeks ago, that, you know, you, you know, that life isn't fair. Things happen in life. We just go ahead and do it. And you know what, life on this, on this earth is not going to be fair. And so for some people say, well, that's not fair. Paul was doing great things. Timothy was doing great things. But you know what? The God of this world, which is Satan, is the one that's running it. And he doesn't want it to be a perfect world. He doesn't want it to be a good thing. And obviously, we live in a wicked and uh, sinful world. And so that's why we see this. It is, it's, there's an emphasis in here, the need for endurance. Now, we know that some people will teach that because they read, you know, that says those who will endure to the end will be saved. So they say, well, you got you to gotta somehow hold on to your salvation. You don't want to lose it. He's not talking about that because in a parallel passage, he says that no flesh, you know, would be saved. In other words, what he's talking about, he said this body, and he's talking about the end times. Because if you read about the end times, you read about the great tribulation, those going through that great tribulation, what's going to happen? They're going to be persecuted. They're going to be put to death. And he's saying, you know what? Basically, with all the stuff going on, it's going to take some endurance for you to, you know, in order for you to still live. Why? Because they're going to try and kill you. And so, you know, the fact that somebody uses those verses that are taken completely out of context, it, you know, doesn't hold water. But he's sinner saying, there's a need for endurance. You're going to have to do it. I, was, uh, I just saw uh, Pastor Ed Sherrill on Monday, and he was talking about how there's ministers, there's pastors, 1,800 of them leave the ministry, at, you know, every month. So there's 1,800 pastors that will leave the ministry. Well, the thing is, is that he's telling them there's a need for endurance. Sometimes you're going to get your feelings hurt in ministry. It's going to happen. Sometimes you're, you're going to do things that people won't see, they won't thank you for it or anything else, or they will see you do it, and they, don't, they still won't thank you for it. But the Bible doesn't say that we're going for that. We're, you know, we're doing the work as unto the Lord, and he's saying there is a, a need for endurance. The fact also he wants us to emphasize the importance of Scripture. There, uh, there was a, uh, a book that came out a few years ago that said, that basically the author said that the Bible wasn't sufficient enough, that they needed a, a greater experience because, you know, the Bible just wasn't enough. And that person was uh, Sarah Young. She wrote a book called Jesus Calling. That entire book is about that. And so it became a Christian number one bestseller. But in the first edition of it, she said, you know, she, uh, you know that she heard of these, this group called The Listeners. 
And the listeners were ones that would, you know, oh, I'm just going to listen to Jesus. Whatever he tells me, I'm going to write down. And that's what she wrote for Jesus Calling. But what she said was, she said, you know what, I just got so disgruntled that, you know, it just, the Bible just wasn't enough. I just needed extra revelation. I needed more. Well, that's dangerous, extremely dangerous, and it can lead to a lot of heresy. And the thing is, is that the Bible is sufficient. The Bible is everything that we need, and I'm guaranteeing that she hasn't, you know, memorized the entire Bible. The fact is, is that, you know, uh, she, you know, was unsatisfied with what God gave her, and she wanted some new, uh, new revelation. And yet, you know, I'm guessing that there might be, a, uh, you know, maybe a few or something like that, because it was so popular that some people might have given it to you as a gift. I would say throw it away. Or else you're going along the same lines because, you know what, that's what you know, all these old uh, cults like the you know, Book of Mormon and all that, that the Bible isn't sufficient enough. You've got to have extra revelation. The Bible is the only revelation I need. And that's all we need as Christians. They're also, the reality of opposition and persecution. You will, if you are a Christian, you will see opposition. You will see persecution. It may not... In America, it may not be how we read in the Bible, because in America, for the most part, you don't see deaths or anything else like that, but you will have opposition. Just wait until you, you come around for the holidays. You'll have family come over, the unsaved loved ones that we just got done praying for, they'll begin to oppose you because of your thing. You know, it might be the fact that five years ago, you asked if we could pray over the meal, and you guys have been you know, saying grace over the meal for the past five years, and somebody goes, well, why do we keep doing that? That's a stupid tradition. That's, that would be opposition, wouldn't it? And so, like, you're going to have those things. But he's talking about the fact in there because he knows, Paul knows that he's getting, he's, he's getting ready to face death. And he's saying, this is a reality of the Christian life, that you will suffer persecution. This, uh, you know, this, like I said, this, this letter is, is written, obviously, like I said, to Timothy. We know this. He was ordained the first bishop or pastor of the church at, uh, of the Ephesians. He uh, was written from Rome. And this happened during the time when Paul was brought before Nero the second time. If you don't know who Nero was, he was one of the ones. They thought that when Nero came into power, because of the intense persecution that he had uh, towards Christians, that that was the book of Revelation, that that was the end times, because he hated Christians. He got joy, like he got his jollies out of the fact of killing Christians. Like he, I mean, um, you know, you ever heard of the, the Roman Colosseum? like, oh, yeah, they rip people apart. They don't tell you the part, who they ripped apart. Those were Christians. They had them in there, they, you know, lions, and they're ripping over. He was like one of the ones that got joy out of that kind of stuff. Like he sat there and would just, you know, it, it brought excitement to his life. I mean, he was a very sick person. And so, like, he went around uh, killing people. It caused a lot of the Christians to scatter, which, in a sense, was a blessing. And you say, well, why? How could that be a blessing? Because it caused them to scatter, and they didn't all stay in one spot, and it caused them to take the gospel everywhere. That's the thing is that most people don't realize when intense persecution happened, people scatter, and then the gospel spreads. Because, you know, sometimes I think, you know, you know, I, you are, sorry, I believe that God allows, you know, that persecution to happen so that way the gospel can be spread. Because it needs to. Sometimes we get complacent with where we're at in our Christian walk, and we don't want to talk to anybody about the Lord. So the Lord's like, eh, yeah, we'll send a little persecution their way. Maybe that'll rile them up a little bit, you know. This was written around uh, 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 around the years 50 to 70 A.D., probably like right around 66 A.D. There's, you know, uh, that's the common denominator or the common timeline uh, that they had. But, you know, and uh, he's writing, obviously, Paul loves his fellow co-worker, Timothy. He looks at him as a son in the faith. And uh, he, like I say, encourages him to continue in that faith, to boldly proclaim it, despite of all that stuff, all the persecution and opposition. And uh, he urges, again, over and over again, you're going to see that he urge, he's urged Timothy to be strong and faithful in the ministry while he's facing this suffering and hardship. So the main, the main key themes is perseverance and faith and ministry despite opposition and suffering. Sound doctrine and the importance of, teach, uh, of teaching and holding the truth of the gospel. He also will warn against false teachers and the need to avoid their influence. Not try to... This is a, um, a quote that I, you know, this is a saying that I've heard over and over again. Well, sometimes you got to go, you got to listen to the message, you got to find the meat and spit out the bones. In other words, what they're saying is, 
I got to find out what's good in their sermon, take that, and then just get rid of all the other stuff. So right there, you're, uh, you're admitting that the person who's preaching to you is not preaching 100% truth, that they're mixing in lies along with it. Why would you, I mean, why, you know, why go to a church where the, the pastor doesn't preach the word of God? Where he either preaches a, his opinion or a popular trend. And you, I mean, I, I would think that after seven years, you guys would know that I don't, I don't preach the popular trends. I kind of, you know, look at what God's word and I, you know, go against them. I mean, I'm not going to go against a popular trend just because it's popular. I'm going to go against it because of the fact that it's not biblical. But the ultimate, and the thing is, is that what he will see is the ultimate reward for faithful service to Christ. We will be rewarded. Not, not just with eternal life. I, was, I, I share that, that image, you know, that uh, um, illustration that, uh, and I remember who, uh, who told me it was Pastor Ken Ham of uh, Answers in Genesis. We went to uh, the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum. Had, the, you know, the, the thought of, of, you know, think of like the, the, the you know, what's mo- the most beautiful creation that you ever saw? Like, what part of creation do you like? Um, you know, the, I like both going to the ocean, I like hearing the waves crash upon the shore, that piece, but I also like going out to the mountains and, you know, in the woods and, and, and hearing the river come, you know, whatever I like, you know, to me, and I love those things. But his thing was, it says, you think about that thing that's most beautiful. Maybe, you know, for you, it's like the fact that you grew up on a farm and you remember that there was a rooster that would always crow and then the, the sun rise, and that was the most perfect situation for you. You said that, that was the greatest, you know. And you think about that. But all of these situations, it's all been marred by sin. It's not perfect. Why? Because we live in a, in a wicked and sinful world that's been marred by sin. Even creation, all of creation groans for his return, Right? So when we get to the new earth, that it will be perfect, we will finally see, like what we look at and say, man, that's a pure, perfect mountain, or that ocean, oh, just, it's, so, it's gonna, I don't know how you can make it more perfect, but it will be, Jesus will do it, I, I know that, that and it, it just causes me to sit there and think, man, as much as I see some of that beauty that I think is, that is pretty awesome, God says, no, you know what, I'm about ready to show you something else, I mean, that's just, you know, something more perfect, in that, and so the key verse that we're going to see throughout this entire uh, this entire book is is in this first chapter. It's uh, it's uh, verse seven. It says, "For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind." I mean, to me, how much more appropriate is the fact that we are in October? We don't, you know, uh, you know. It seems like everybody's forgotten the fact that it's fall. They say, "Oh, it's fall." That means it's Halloween. No. I celebrate fall. I, I enjoy the changing of the seasons. I'm not, you know, following, you know, all this other stuff. But I find it, you know, ironic that we're going into here. Hadn't planned it that way. It's just obviously the way it worked, you know, that's the way, you know, it works out. But that God says that he has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. The only thing that I would ask to somebody that, you know, that's a Christian that says, you know what, Halloween is harmless fun. It's just for kids. You shouldn't have to convince a child that is afraid of the death and all that stuff around them that it's okay. When a kid is genuinely scared of the things that they are seeing around them, that they have fear and they have like nightmares of it and whatever, and you say, no, it's okay. And you got to try and justify that. How is that? Okay, I'm going to get off on another rant, but I'm just saying, how is that like a children's holiday? How is that, you know, just for kids when you're, when you got to like try to negotiate, you got to try to manipulate that situation in order for them to actually accept that. Because I see all that death and everything else out there and I'm going, you know what? God hasn't, God doesn't want me to look at that death. You know, why do I want to indulge in the, you know, what the wicked enjoy? That's all my intro. Don't worry, you know, I'll, we're going to go on here. Number one is this, Paul, we're going to see Paul's love for Timothy and Timothy's unfeigned faith. This is in the first five verses. I'm going to read that again because, it, you, know, because I, you know, I just read it, but it was a little bit ago. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of, of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Now think about that. According to the promise of, of life, which is in Christ Jesus. What, what promise is that? Eternal life. That they are basically... Uh, basically spiritual father and son. Why? Because of the gospel. Because of that, that promise that they have in Christ Jesus. It says to Timothy, my beloved 
Dearly beloved Son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I remember I remembrance of thee in my prayers day and night. He says, you know what? Every time that I pray, whether I'm, it's day or night, I'm always praying for you. I'm always praying for you. And this is what it says, that what, what he wants to see through his prayers is this, greatly desiring to see thee, so he wants to see him again, but most likely he knows that he won't. Why? Because he's on a death sentence. He says, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. It, it saddens him that he's not going to be able to see Timothy, but he's also like, you know what? When I think about you and I pray for you, I'm also filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which first dwell, uh, dwelt in, which dwelt first in thy mother Lois and thy uh, mother Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee also. And so, what we see throughout, you know, Paul wants Timothy, uh, like I said, wants to see him before his execution, but knows that seeing him is probably not going to happen. That probably the next time that he sees him is going to be an eternity. And that's what brings him joy on that. But his unfeigned faith, unfeigned, it's not necessarily a word we use. Sometimes people use it now because it sounds cool. It's like a new catchphrase, unfeigned, like, oh. But what that would necessarily mean, all it means is a sincere, genuine faith. It's not hypocritical, it's not fake. It's not, you know, just lip service. It's not somebody just coming out and, and saying one thing and doing another. No, it's a genuine faith that Timothy has. Why? Because he learned that, that kind of faith from the women in his life. It didn't seem like he had a father or his, maybe his father was not, you know, saved or, you know, or whatnot if he, if he had a father. So he learned that unfeigned faith from his grandmother and his mother. They taught him the word. And this is, you know, the part is that they taught him. They didn't depend upon the church to teach him. They didn't depend upon the public school to teach him. They didn't depend upon anybody else. They taught him. Yes, they could you know, go to synagogue and everything else, and they would learn, because that's what you know, you know, little Jewish boys you know, probably, you know, did. But they didn't depend upon that. They taught on the Word of God. It is our responsibility as adults to teach the younger generation the Word of God. Because if we don't teach them, somebody will teach them, but it's going to be a false gospel. It'll be something, you know, don't you want to teach your children what they should know and not the stuff that they don't, definitely don't need to know? I mean, that's one of the biggest things that's, you know, one of the biggest uh, things, that, you know, with the uh, government right now is they want to teach everybody, you know, all the kids what they want them to, to learn in public schools, which is not biblical, which is, you know, it's completely anti-God. It's, you know, it's anti-Christ, you, know, uh, you know, stuff that they want to teach, but we should sit there and say, you know what? I'm going to teach my kid the Bible. I'm going to teach him what the Word of God says. And so when they hear something from a friend or a teacher or whoever it is that's in an authority that's wrong, they know it. That they don't sit there and just blindly go, oh, okay, well, they're an authority figure, so they must be right. I mean, that's how I was taught, like, growing up, is that if it's an authority figure, they say it, it's gospel truth, which is very, very, you know, that's a, a, a dangerous uh, place to be. So this, the, the, the second point is to stir up the gift. This is the part about how to maintain that fire. Stir up the gift of God. Verses 6 and 7 says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the, uh, by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. For one thing, you know, in here it says that thou stir up the gift of God, or you stir up the gift of God. It's not going to be a, a certain song service that you know, should get you riled up. It shouldn't be a certain pastor that has, to get you, that has to sit there and jump through hoops, do backflips and everything else to get you riled up. It says you are to stir up the gift of God in you. That what, what God has placed in you, what, what, you know, the word of God that he wants you know, to instill in your life, that that's something that you stir up yourself. Somebody else can't do it for you. They can't do it for you. But it says, you stir it up. You stir up the gift of God. And you're going, oh, oh, thanks, Pastor. But it's the fact that, you know, I, we want to go to conferences. We want to go to all these different, you know, worship galleries. We want to go to, you know, some, oh, this preacher. Oh, they put revival on the church sign. You should live a life of revival. 
We should all, when we stir up the gift of God, it should be us saying, you know what? I want to, you know, stir up that gift inside of me. I want to live in a life of revival. You know what revival looks like? I'll tell you what it looks like. And it's not running on top of, you know, pews. It's not screaming around the church. It's not any of that. It's not the fact of screaming during worship. It's not any of that. Revival is when a Christian stirs up that gift of God and they actually go out and do what God asked them to do, which is see the lost saved. When you start seeing you know, uh, you know, uh, people saved through your life, that is a life of revival. Or the fact that, that you're, you're just willing to go out and do the will of God, which is to preach the gospel to people. And the fact that, you know, that you, revival is also the fact that you want to sit there and you want to study and meditate upon God. I know this is not like the, you know, the, the greatest, like, oh man, this is oh great, you know, Pastor. No, this is a working sermon. This is the thing that you have to work. That's why they call it the work of God. Is the fact that it's not the fact that you're trying to get more saved. Because you can't get any more saved than you already are. Because the Bible says that you have already been saved to the uttermost. You can't get more saved. There is no, there's like, I'm 10th level salvation. You're only level three. No. The Bible says that he saved you to the uttermost. What he's saying in here is that if you want to stir you know, all that up, a life of revival is preaching the gospel, meditating upon God's word, praying, talking to people about the Lord. I'm not saying you've got to be that annoying person that every single word out of your mouth is some sort of like antidote. But you know, be like, well, you know that. You know, I'm saying the fact is that you're looking for those opportunities to share the gospel, and you have that desire, that passion to see people saved. And you want to, uh, here's the other part, and you want to see them discipled. You want to, you're not going to just leave them, you know, uh, you know, out there. Yes, we go to door to door. You know, we see people, you know, saved at the door. We give them all the information that we can, but we cannot make them come to church. Okay? Our job is to go out. But when they come in here, it's our job, it's our responsibility to say, you know what? Now we're going to build them up. We're going to help them grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. All right? So when they come in, they're ours, right? You know, it's our responsibility. But we can't. I could sit up, we could send postcards, we can go visit them, but we cannot make them, because if you make them come, you're kidnapping, and that's illegal. But the, the fact of stirring up the gift of God, it denotes the stoking of a fire. How many have ever been out on a, a camping trip? How many like camping? Like, I'm talking about under a tent. I know, Miss Tanya, I like your style of camping, too. But I'm talking about the fact, I mean, but I know that Jay, uh, you know, uh, will build a fire and all that kind of stuff and, and all that stuff. And you've been out there, and the thing is, is why do you build a fire? Well, they say, well, because of s'mores. You know, people say s'mores or they want to share a camp story, campfire and everything else. But it, the fact that, you know, that if you don't stoke the fire, if you don't add fuel, if you don't, you know, uh, give proper kindling, if you don't give it air and all that, what's going to happen to that fire if you don't take care of it? It's going to blow out, right? You got to take care of those things. And so think about, like, Maybe when you were younger, that campfire, like you went out, you had a tent, and it was a cold night camping. Because it's never a warm night when you're camping, you know, because you don't want to go out when it's warm because then you sweat in your sleeping bag, right? So you have that, you know, you get that, you're at this cold night, you have that fire going that's keeping you warm, right? And you're able to sleep well, even with the cold air all around you because of the fire, but you must also keep that going. I know, uh, do you know what the first and most important thing is in a survival situation? What is the first and uh, foremost, the most important thing you can do? It is not, you know, look for food. It is not shelter. And you say, well, don't you need, yes, you do need those. Or it's not any of those. The number one thing is, it's a fire. Do you know the reason why? Because everything else depends upon that fire. Because if you're out in a survival situation, most likely you're not going to fry in fresh water. So what do you got to do? You got to get that water. You got to boil it so you can have some water to drink. If you find some food, you can't eat it raw. I mean, obviously, unless it's like vegetables. But I'm saying if you find an animal, you're not supposed to eat it raw because or else you're going to be getting sick. You got to cook it. And that fire, you know, is also going to help you as far as like shelter wise. If you're not able to find a shelter, at least you have something that's going to keep you warm while you wait. Also, it'll keep away predators. All this stuff does that. And so when you maintain that fire, you got to blow on that you know, fire, you know, uh, make sure the air is getting to it. You got to add more fuel to it. You got to add more wood to it. 
You got to uh, you got to keep it from getting quenched. You can't. You got to you got to protect it. You can't let the wind or the rain or any outside force squelch it, like we talked about before, or the fact of making sure that you maintain it and you shield it and protect it. The Bible talks about this in Leviticus. You say, well, Leviticus? It does. The Bible talks about this in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 6. It talks about maintaining this fire. It says this in Leviticus chapter uh, 6, verse 12 and 13. It says, and the fire upon the altar shall be burning uh, in it. It shall not be put out. The priest shall burn uh, wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in, uh, in order upon it. And he shall burn uh, thereon uh, the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. So in order for a priest to, you know, obviously we know that the, the, the Bible talks about the New Testament priesthood. Who is that? Believers. As a, as a royal priesthood, as the Bible says, is that we are to never let that fire go out. Well, there's a symbolism, there's a picture of the Christian life. The word represents the death to self. The wood that we're supposed to you know, put on there so it doesn't go out, we are, that fire we are to put on there is ourself, is the fact of like that, that sacrifice of saying, you know what, I'm crucifying the flesh, I die daily, I need to put myself on there, that includes my sin, all those things to keep the thing going. Every morning, we, should, uh, we need to learn to die to self and become more like Christ. This is how we maintain that fire. This is how we add more fuel to the fire. Because you know what? In this campfire story and everything else that we're talking about, we live in a, car, a cold, dark, sinful, and wicked world. And we must fan the flame, crucify our flesh daily, and protect and shield the fire or else we will be cold, weak, and tired. If we are waiting for the next great meeting to happen or the next great conference to happen, then we've already been cold for way too long. If we're depending upon that in order to get us ignited, it's harder to do that than it is for you just to get into God's word and you know what, and, and, and maintain that. Because if you do it daily, those things that seem monotonous, you're like, oh, I don't know, I'm not feeling it today. I don't know if I can read God's word because I got all this stuff going on. Those are the days where you need God's word the most. Push through, persevere. Why? Because you know what? You don't want to be cold, weak, and tired. Because you get cold, weak, and tired in a survival situation, you ain't surviving. And this is not like Hollywood where all of a sudden the person's about ready to die and all of a sudden they just find them at the nick of time. That happens sometimes, but it doesn't happen all the time. I mean, it's not a Hollywood ending. This ain't Disney. In verse 6, we see the fact that, you know, when he talks about the laying on of hands or the putting on of his hands, Paul took part in Timothy's ordination. He was the fact of him, like, you, know, uh, you know, of him becoming a pastor. He, he oversaw him. He, he knew everything. That, you know, um, he was there with him. And so that's what we see there. And the fact is that Paul is doing all of this, saying, reminding him of all this. Why? Because ministry can be scary. Especially when you see when you see other Christians being persecuted, tortured, or even martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ, that's what's happening around Timothy. That's happening with Paul. He knows, you know, Timothy's like my dad, you know, my spiritual father here is getting ready to be, you know, executed here most likely any day. My friends are getting whatever, and it could be a scary situation when you got people that are mad. How will that look nowadays? Imagine you know, and I, I don't say this that far off, and this is not really an imagination thing, the fact of like you coming to church and you have to get through a crowd of angry people because of the Bible's being preached here. Would you still come? If there was a, if, if people were blocking, you're trying to block those doors and do everything possible, whatever, would you still come to this church? You say, you know what, I'll just catch you next week. Or would you say, you know, I'll just catch it up on YouTube or uh, Facebook. I don't need that. Or would you say, you know what? No, I need to go be with the saints. I need to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. I want to go hear God's word. And the thing is, is that w when that happens, because I believe that it, you know, it will happen in America the way you know, things are going, when that happens, know that we're doing something right. You say, well, how is that? You know, people should be met. Yes, they, people will. We're reading it right now that in Paul's time and everything else. And it, you say, well, that's Paul's time. That's biblical times. No. 
in the life of a Christian, you will suffer persecution and, and trial and tribulation. Why not, if you're going to, you know, get, if people are going to come after you, why not it be for the gospel? Why, why not it be, you know, for Jesus Christ? Why does it have to be something political? We think that we're, you know, like, oh man, I'm suffering persecution because, you know, I, I did this pro-Trump, like, post on Facebook and all these liberals came after me and I'm like, really? That's your persecution? I would rather post a Bible verse and somebody come after me and be like, well, you know, and, and, and go after that persecution than like, oh, yeah, well, you know, I, I did this post. I did an anti, you know, an anti-Democrat post and all, you know, and all these uh, liberals came after. I did, or I did a pro-liberal one and then all these uh, you know, conservatives came after me. Or Who cares about politics? It's not going to save us. Politics is not the Savior. Politicians are not the Savior. Jesus Christ is the Savior. So if that happens, you know, like you're coming to church and the people are like protesting outside and, you know, have these signs and saying that we're, you know, whatever kind of church, are you going to sit there and say, you know what, I like pastor all the way up until this happened. I mean, I went there, you know, for 30 years, but I can go to another church. So, you know, my, my question would be is, so do you want to go to a church where God's not doing something? But yet I hear all the time from people, they say they want to go to a church where God's on the move. God being on the move is a lot different than what people think. Oftentimes when people hear the, uh, you know, that phrase, God's on the move, what they, they think, oh, it's good song service. Oh, the preaching is, oh, the altar service. No, when God's on the move, this is what you see. Persecution, suffering, all those things. Why? Because we need to change our mind about what is actually successful in the kingdom of God. What's successful in the kingdom of God is the fact that we are living for what God's word says. Number three is this. Remain faithful and patient, especially in persecution and trial. I've already been kind of talking about this a little bit, but we look at this. Paul is telling Timothy, don't ever be ashamed of what Jesus Christ did for you when he's talking about the testimony of, God, of the Lord. When he says, don't be ashamed, he's saying, you know what? Don't ever be ashamed of what Jesus did for you. Don't ever do it. I mean, there's been times where somebody's like, you know, kind of getting made fun of or whatever because they became a Christian, and somebody all of a sudden is just like, they just like slump over. And it's like almost like they became, you know, ashamed. I'll just tell you my experience when that happened. I was like, man, this is awesome because I see that in the Bible. I see people getting made fun of and mocked and beaten and whatever, and I, all they did was make fun of me? That's nothing. But my wife says I'm a, I'm a strange breed anyway, so, you know, it's not the fact that I get my, you know, whatever. It's just, it's not the fact that I get joy out of people making fun of me. But it's the fact that it's for the gospel. He also says, nor of me. Paul doesn't want Timothy to be ashamed of what Paul was going through, you know, through either. Because Paul's going through it because of the gospel. He's going through it because of Jesus Christ. He's in prison because he was sharing the gospel. He wasn't sharing recipes. He wasn't sharing his opinion about, you know, uh, the new presidential election coming up. He wasn't sharing, you know, he wasn't sharing, you know, on Facebook. About, no, he was sharing the gospel, and that's what they didn't like. How many times that we read in the book of Acts where they say they can be released, but they're not allowed to speak in that name again? What name? Jesus. They're being persecuted for the fact of being a Christian, for preaching Jesus. They tell them, don't talk about him, because they say if, they, if they, we can get them to shut up, then it stops, the, it stops the spread. Kind of like COVID-19, you know, two weeks to end, you know, end, you know, the end of the spread, right? Didn't end it, but the thing is, you just, it's the same thing with the gospel. You continue to talk about it, you keep, you know, whatever, it's going to continue to spread. You shut up and, and, and keep to yourself because you're afraid that people are not going to like you, it stops the spread. Can we spread the gospel faster than COVID-19 can, you know, get out there? You say, well, that's, you know, airborne. Well, you know what? So is our voice. It's the same way. It's the same way in that. But in uh, verse 8, it says, But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. That He says, you be a partaker of the afflictions. You guys know what afflictions are, right? Suffering, torture, pain. He says, you know what? That you should partake in that. Why? Because that's the gospel. I know that people don't sit there and enjoy that. I'm not saying that we should be getting excited about somebody beating us. 
Or that we should, you know, that we should just be like, oh, yes, please, a little more, a little more kick into the ribs right here. That, you know, that would be better. I'm not saying, I'm not being like a masochist here. I'm saying the fact is, is that when that happens, says, you know what? Don't just, you know, sit there and try to hide from it or run away from it, but say, you know what? I'm being counted worthy because of the gospel. Count it all joy. Amen. He said, you know, and the reason why, he says, why? Because he saved us, he called us, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. It's because that he saved us, he's called us, he's done those things. And and I like how he inserts, not according to your works, because it's not about you. It's what Jesus Christ did. He saved you. He called you. You can't mess up your salvation. You know that, right? Because if we would, we could. Or if he could, we would. We would, we would mess that up and we would be losing it. We'd be losing it more than we lose our keys. He made the way possible before the world began. In verse 10, it talks about, you know, it, uh, yeah, in verse 10, it says, But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality uh, to light uh, through the gospel. The latter part of verse 9 says that which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So he made that way possible. Like the whole Jesus going to the cross and being, uh, you know, being able to uh, pardon all sin was not plan B. That was always the plan. That was always the plan was to provide a way for us to be able to go to heaven. He loved us enough that even before it all, you know, before we would say, oh, man, it just all messed up, Adam. Wait, good job, Adam. Good job, Eve. No, before the world began, that was the plan. So he knew it was going to happen. Verse, you know, like I said, verse 10, it talks about the fact of him being manifest, that Jesus didn't, he wasn't crucified privately. It wasn't like they, you know, they crucified him to a cross inside of some place and like locked it up so nobody could see it. No, it was openly in public. He, you know, he endured public shame and scorn for us, right? And it says that he destroyed death or abolished it. And he gives all, he gives all who would believe on him that they would receive eternal life and immortality because of the go- good news of the gospel. By, he destroyed death. He abolished it. Why? Because he wanted that possibility. He wanted to, you know, to give the opportunity to everyone to have eternal life. Verse 11 and 12 says this. It says, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed uh, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He says right, the, right there is the fact is that, well, it says Paul was a, as a preacher, teacher, apostle, suffered, but he wasn't ashamed. Why? Because he said, I know in whom I have believed. He says, I'm not going to be ashamed about that because you know what? Jesus wasn't ashamed of me. I'm not going to be ashamed of somebody that did all that for me a wicked, wretched sinner. He said, I'm not going to be ashamed of that. And the fact also, because he says, uh, the fact that he is is able to keep that which I have committed. What does he did? What did he commit? His life to him. That he's able to keep it. Keep what? His salvation. That nothing was going to change that. He was on his way to heaven. That God is able to keep you, right? It says that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That day, the day that he goes, you know, either he is raptured or he's, he's taken to the Lord. Obviously, we know that he wasn't raptured because we're still here. And Paul's not living for, you know, 2,000 years after, you know, Christ died, Okay. We see the same sediment that Paul has when he writes the book of Romans. Romans came after, uh, you know, and the writing came after 2 Timothy. He says this in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He tells the reason why. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. 
to the Jew first and also to the, the Greek. And there's some people that read that part about the Jew first and like, oh, see, the Jews are still special to God. No, what he is saying there is, you know what? The Jews had the truth. They're the ones that, that, they, that God gave the truth to so they could be a light unto the nations, and then they kept it to himself. So he's saying, you know what? I gave it to them first, and now I'm taking it to the Greeks, you know, the Greeks or the Gentiles, because why? Because they didn't do it, so I'm hoping somebody else can. I'm not saying that every single Jew like, ever you know, was like anti-God, anti-Christ, or anything else, but there was not enough. So God said, you know what? I'm going to take it to everyone. And the thing is that we see in the Old Testament that it's not just Jewish people that are saved. You know how I know that? Well, for one thing, Moses married a God-fearing woman. She was Ethiopian, and she was not Jewish. That's one example. There's many more. Number four is this. Remain persistent in the doctrinal truth. Remain persistent in the doctrinal truth. What doctrinal truth? What Paul had taught him and reminded him about in 1 Timothy. What did Paul talk to, uh, talk to him about in 1 Timothy? That's what he's reminding him. He's saying, you know what? Remain persistent in what I taught you there. Plus the fact of what he, he, taught to, uh, he taught him that was not mentioned in 1 Timothy that's in the other part of, of the Bible. So what does he teach? He says, you know what? Teach sound biblical doctrine. In other words, warn against false teaching. Why, do, why does the Bible warn against false teaching? Well, for one thing, it exists. And the thing is, is that false teaching and false, all this, you know, false teaching and doctrine can lead people astray. And we don't want to lead people astray, right? We want to lead people to Christ. And uh, the second one that, you know, that he uh, talks about here, uh, in, that he was talking about in 1 uh, Timothy, is godly uh, character and proper leadership. There was instruction for church leaders, including the qualifications for a pastor, for pastors and deacons. Number three was this. He, taught him, he, he encouraged prayer. Paul encourages the church to pray for all people, including those in authority, and to lead quiet and peaceful lives. That's what Miss Jackie wants. She wants a quiet and peaceful life. She doesn't want that drama. But that's what he says. He encourages people to pray. He encourages the church to pray. And then one of the last things he taught about in 1 Timothy that he's reminding him about and saying that you need to do this is conduct. Paul teaches on the proper conduct for women, men and women in the church, that there are certain roles in the church, and this is how God says that it's supposed to be in the church. When, when it's in the church, that's how it should be at home, and that's how it should be lived out in life. It's not you know, a separate thing like, okay, well, I'm at church, so I need to you know, switch roles now, and then I go back home, and then I, I switch again, and then whatever. This is not modalism. This is not oneness Pentecostalism. This is not you know, the whole like, Jesus' name only stuff. This is not the stuff where God changes modes or he's schizophrenic where he all of a sudden he's like, oh, wait, nope, I'm the Father now. No, wait, oh, now I'm the Holy Spirit. No, there are three distinct persons in one. That's called the Trinity. But God says, you know what, there are certain you know, roles that uh, men have and certain roles that women have. And you know what, it's not a matter of, you know, people say, well, you know what, a woman can do anything that a man can do and a man can do anything that a woman can do. I'm not saying that, they're, they, that, you know, that that's not true. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that there are roles you know, that you should not do, and why? Because you know what? God hasn't called you to do that. If God wanted you to do it, he would have told you to do it. He says, you know what? This is the role for the man. This is the role for the woman. Stay there. He never said that, oh, uh, you know, I don't think that this woman can, you know, you know she can't bench. I'm not going to say like bench like 500 pounds. She can go ahead. And, he's like, go ahead and do it. He says, but you know what? I'll tell you right now that the man's going to be able to do it a little bit easier because of bone density, of the you know,
Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for tonight. Lord, help us to maintain that fire that we 